negatively, uh, they just want to make more money. And what they found is the bigger the plane, the more seats for the cost, they could make more money. So there's a movement for airlines to move away from what was once small aircraft, 25, 50, 60 passengers. Now the smallest regional aircraft you can find is about 75 passengers. What happens when you have to do that, and you have to fill the plane about 70, 75% in order to be profitable on it, doing that in a small airport is problematic. So not only is there a move to larger and larger aircraft, there's a move to larger and larger airports. So the people losing out are the small communities, rural communities, secondary airports, etc. If you look at kind of the graph, you're seeing this year 22% of all flights in the US will be done by aircraft 50 seats or below. It used to be 45% a little over 10 years ago. So think of what that means for the exact same flight. The passengers, what that means to accessibility, etc. So that's one thing that's happening. Another thing is that it just isn't attractive from a fuel perspective. Uh, fuel represents 30 to 50 percent of the airline's operating costs. 30 to 50 percent. And oil prices are going up. We're now at 83, 84 dollars per uh, barrel. We were at 60 a little while ago. So oil prices are going up. Even if they stay at this level of 80, it becomes a really expensive to operate now. So that's another thing that's happening. The third is that a survey in 2017 showed that passengers want to fly mostly based on price. Service is great, but you know, it's a bus. We've all come to realize that air transportation today is not the cool experience that even I as a child remember it being. It's just a mode of transport. So price wins. So the cheaper the price, the better. And when you have less small aircraft flying from less small cities, that means that the airlines that do fly there, the prices are expensive. I checked what it would cost me to fly to Spokane from here tomorrow morning, and it's about $600 return to Spokane. 280 miles. That's crazy. $600. Now, if I plan it two weeks away, I can get it for 200 which is somewhat reasonable. But if I'm a business person, and I'm living on the, in the on-demand economy, I don't plan my business two weeks in advance. I want to go visit my customer or my employee tomorrow, and I want to make that decision today. So $600 is unrealistic. On the other hand, driving to Spokane, four and a half to five hours, unrealistic either. So if we look at a practical example, if I'm an Amazon, a Microsoft, a Starbucks, <coughs> my previous software company, a small company in Bellevue that did software, we were looking to build a second design center because in Seattle, there are 5,000 open software development jobs today. 5,000 open software development jobs. They can't get enough people. Spokane has three universities, three, in Spokane that teach computer science and engineering. Those folks can't get a job unless they come to Seattle. The companies here won't open a dev center in Spokane. Why? Because I don't want to drive four and a half hours to visit my employees, and I definitely don't want to pay 600 bucks every time I go on and want to go visit them, with frequencies that went once an hour. What if the frequency was once every 15 minutes? It was 100 bucks tomorrow, and I only had to fill nine or 10 seats in a plane. That would change the whole notion of on demand, right? And let the airlines not lose out, but let the airlines put their larger 7,500 seat planes that were built for a thousand miles or more in efficiency, let them fly those longer routes. Now, my previous employer, Boeing, may not like that, uh, or Airbus, because they like the fact that people buy airplanes that they don't need, and it's a really great source of income. I own Boeing stock, and I love that as well. But it's not really good for the passenger. It's not really good for communities. So Spokane stays a little secondary town. A place like Ellensburg, which also has a university, Whitman, phenomenal program for computer science and engineering. There's no flights at all. They have to either drive to Wenatchee to get something, drive to Tri-Cities, or drive to SeaTac. So places like that don't have commu communications at all. Now that's passenger. Who here has Amazon Prime? A lot, right? There's a reason I love Amazon. There's a reason they're successful. How long does it take us to get a delivery? A day or two, or max, or two hours, where I live, two hours. Almost anything I want in two hours. If you're in Ellensburg, five days. If you're in Spokane, five days. There's no crime to make delivery in Spokane, because it's too expensive to get there, or too long by truck. What happens if you can take a little 9, 10, 15 passenger plane, instead of seats, food, and packages? 
and let Amazon do it for cheaper, or any other delivery company. So that's what really drives us. When we look in general at what the future of electric aviation looks like in transportation, we really divide the spectrum into three. On the left is what we call the first and last mile, 20 to 25 to 50 mile range in a city or the, the suburbs of a city. This is where you'll see a lot of the really sexy Jetsons type vertical takeoff and landing, Uber is involved, Bell Helicopter, everyone wants to be part of it, right? You'll be landing on the Columbia Center in Seattle, taking that to your home, you're landing in, your, in front of your garage, right? We've all seen those movies, those really good 3D animation. That happened one day, one day, 15, 20 years from now. And it's not that this is a huge technological problem, but if you take the fact that it's a new type of aircraft, an aircraft that has no wings and no big rotor, so no one knows about it, it's all electric, so you have all the issues that go with it being a new type of propulsion, and it's gonna be flying inside a city taking off and landing from buildings. As is, there's great tight regulation for helicopters and that's never taken off, pun intended, let alone a vertical takeoff and landing. So these are great ideas, really sexy to talk about, but it'll take time until it happens. The motors they need, if we tie it back into why we exist, the motors they need, 80 to 150 kilowatts. 150, 200 horsepower, no more than that. Air-cooled, they're gonna be flying at 1,000 feet, very low altitude, very slow, very short distances, not a big deal. So that's first and last mile. There are also alternatives. We may not like them, but driving, buses, subways, and places that have them. There are a bunch of alternatives to solve that problem. Not as nice as a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, but it exists. Other complete stream, no <coughs> flights above 1,000 miles. Cross the United States, Seattle to New York, New York to London, Seattle to Brisbane, I'm gonna do that, it's actually Seattle, LA, LA to Brisbane, I'm gonna do that this Sunday to go visit our company. Those don't need a lot of issues. Very efficient aircraft. Boeing, Airbus do a phenomenal job in making those aircraft really efficient for those distances. Now again, it would be great to make them electric, get rid of fuel, get rid of emissions, but until that happens, you're talking probably 40 years away. Battery technology, propulsion technology, et cetera. So we don't deal with that either, and one day that'll happen, that's even farther out. Where we are is the real problem, again, the middle mile. For the reasons I talked about, and for the fact that actually electric aviation could work pretty nicely as a practical solution in the short term. So right now, and I'll talk about this in a second, and I'll start with this uh, comment and we'll talk about it as we go through. If I took a Cessna caravan, I think everyone knows what a Cessna caravan is, right? A workhorse of aviation. Take a Cessna caravan, put a 750 horsepower <coughs> all electric motor on it with battery technology that exists today, not four years from now, but today, you could probably get a 100 mile range. 100 miles. Nothing to write home about, you know, not a big deal. Army Field, 100 mile range, that's what it is. You could fly to Olympia without standing in traffic and see Seattle and Tacoma. You could go to Vancouver, almost, but a small airport or a few runways that are south of Vancouver. You could go to, guess where? Ellensburg, from Harvey Field. So 100 miles isn't phenomenal, but it's pretty practical if you talk about high-end frequencies. So if you're in Everett at Boeing, and you wanted to live in Ellensburg, and you wanted to commute somehow, that might not be a bad deal if the price was right and you could actually have that in high frequency. Or Everett, uh, Painfield to Ellensburg, Painfield to Clay Elum, weekend getaways, things that only the rich and famous can do today with private aviation, you can do with electric. If we look at battery technology as it, we expect it will be from what we're seeing in 2020, you're in about 250 miles. On a Cessna Caravan, 250 miles becomes really interesting. Suddenly, Harvey Field to Portland and South, Spokane and Vancouver become a reality. Amazon, Microsoft, Starbucks could all open dev centers or operations in Spokane and not worry about having to fly or drive it because it will be electric and it will be cheap. Now, when I say cheap, 
A Cessna catamaran going 100 miles flight, about three to $400 is spent on fuel. $12 for electricity. Three to $400 on fuel for 100 miles, $12 for electricity. Let's assume all other costs are equal. Imagine what that does to a ticket price. What profitability allows an airline to actually provide its consumers with flights. So 250 miles suddenly becomes not only practical, but actually really attractive. Right now, Seattle to Spokane is done by either Embraer 175, Dash 8s, sometimes a 737, aircraft that were built on efficiency for longer than 1,000 miles. And yet they're flying 280 mile lengths. Once an hour, 600 bucks. Airlines don't make a lot, go ask Alaska Airlines. They don't make a lot of money, if any, on these flights. But they have to, because that's part of being an airline, you have to go to some secondary markets that maybe aren't that attractive, but that's part of what you have to do. What if you could get rid of that, put those airplanes to use at long distances, and allow a small 9, 10, 15 passenger aircraft to do it electric? About six, seven years from now, 500 miles. 500 miles, uh, you're doing quite a bit. I mean, you're into Idaho, you're up to the way north of Vancouver. If you're in uh, San Francisco, you're making it to Vegas. If you're in New York, you've covered the northeastern seaboard with 500 miles. That's using a Cessna caravan, a plane that was designed quite a few years ago around a PT6 engine. It wasn't built for electric efficiency. It wasn't built for anything that has to do with electric or these ranges. Take, for example, an all-electric aircraft that's being designed, like one by an Israeli company called Eviation. They're taking the concept of what would happen if I designed an aircraft around an electric propulsion system. All revolutions in aviation, if you look back in history, have happened around propulsion. It's not that someone designs a plane and says, hey, could we put a motor on it? It's here's the motor, how do we take advantage of the plane? Throughout history, that's not what happened. So if you take a company like Eviation, they're building a nine-passenger plane they will go 650 miles on today's battery technology. So half the gains that an aircraft gets out of electric propulsion is from the fact that there's no fuel, the fact that there's no emissions, the fact that it's lighter. The other half is from the design of the aircraft. So if you go onto their website and look at their aircraft, their motors are on the wingtips and the back, and they're all pushers, propellers facing back, because that helps with the efficiency of an electric motor for multiple reasons. And they can take advantage of it on motors on the wingtips because the motors are so much lighter that they can actually help with control of the aircraft, etc. So they can get a really good range of 650 miles. So that becomes suddenly interesting. So who's the company? We were founded in 2009 down in Australia, of all places, at an R&D firm looking at electric motors, not necessarily in Asia, but in general. And as we worked through that, we suddenly found and developed this motor that we have now as a prototype that we'll talk about, that we said, wait a minute, this is interesting. 350 horsepower, 110 pounds, liquid cooled, 2,500 RPM. So you could actually do something pretty practical with it. And we looked at who could use this practically. We tried bus, buses, cars, boats, planes, we looked all around, industrial, and figured out the place that power to weight means the most is of course aviation. If a car is heavy, it'll do the zero to 60 in a, little, in a little less time, or a little more time. If a boat's heavy, it'll just float slower. If a plane's heavy, that's a problem, right? It may not take off, or it's a safety hazard. So we chose aviation. As I mentioned, we're in Australia. We have an uh, engineering center down in Australia on the Gold Coast. It's the northeast part of Australia. Uh, and here in Redmond, we just opened a few months ago uh, our global headquarters here and the second engineering center. For now, a group of people, uh, I've been uh, pleasantly shocked at the caliber of people we've been able to pull. It's amazing how much people who work at Boeing, Airbus, SpaceX, Liber, uh, GE Aviation want to be a part of a revolution. And that's really exciting. So we've been able to really pull phenomenal people, uh, both in Australia and here, uh, to be able to be part of the team. So here's what we're talking about. So the motor on the left, what we call the Mavi 5, 
are the motors we have today running on test cells. So we have them running against dynos in, a te in two test cells. And then two weeks ago, we launched our iron burger. And for the first time, an electric motor at 350 horsepower turned an actual Cessna propeller on a, on a fuselage of a caravan, the front end fuselage on an iron burger. Fully on battery, not connected to power, external power. This motor is about 265 kilowatts, 355 horsepower, and you can see the specs here. Now that was interesting, but as we started to build that and work on it, and work with different companies on the application, a few things became interesting, and that was the request from people for more power, but slower. And we think slower. 2,500 RPM is already pretty slow when you compare it to other electric motors or to the PT6s or other motors that are turning at 20, 30, 40,000 RPM. And then you have gearboxes to go down the propeller. And what companies were telling us is, if you can do this, and you can go to lower RPM, we can go direct to propeller. Get rid of the gearbox altogether. Think of what that means on an aircraft. Beyond weight and space, maintenance, breakdowns, gearboxes to deal with, direct to propeller. So is it great? So we just finished designing our 9250 and our 9500, which will create 300, as you can see, a 375 horsepower and 751 horsepower, respectively, both turning at 1900 RPM. Think of that. 1900 RPM, 751 horsepower. We are going to dethrone Pratt Whitney. That's our goal. It's a lofty goal. If you're not going to have a lofty goal, why not one at all? But we're going to get rid of the PT6. Enough of that. It's been way too many years with gas guzzling, high service cost overhaul motors. And we're going to go all electric. So that's our goal. So we have these two motors in development now. Uh, as you can see, max speed, the 1900 is continuous, by the way. One thing that I'll advise you all when you hear about these great electric motors, check a few things when they give you specs. One, is it continuous or max? So we can go, for example, to a max of 3,000 RPM, and instead of having 375 horsepower, get a max of about 450, but 450 seconds. <laughs> Why is that good? If you suddenly need a burst of power to avoid something, for example. You lose one motor, you want the other one to really carry the weight, so to speak, and give a pilot safe landing, as opposed to just operate on one. So that burst of power is important, but you're not going to have it rated for that as continuous, or it would be. So when you hear companies talk about, oh, we do 500 horsepower, well, is that peak or continuous? Second, is it in thermal equilibrium or not? So you guys know about motors and how they work, right? Is the peak that you're measuring or the continuous that you're measuring at operating temperature or cold temperatures? Because if they're cold right out of the box, you can get really good specs, as opposed to when they've been operating for the last four hours. We do everything conservatively. One of the cool things about having aerospace people and experienced ones in here from all different disciplines is we can't get away with bullshit. No one allows us to say, oh, let's put this spec in because it really looks good on paper, but it's really a cold spec and it's not useful. So we really do, we do ourselves a disservice, as, one of, as our chief engineer says. We do ourselves a disservice by saying, here's the honest truth. When it's a, a full thermal equilibrium, and we'll sometimes wait down in Australia three or four hours until we get there, which means that there's 30 minutes between temperature measurements, and there's no more than one degree difference. That's when we know, okay, we're there. Thermal equilibrium, then start measuring performance. And measure peak, measure, in, measure continuous, measure endurance. So those are the specs we're looking at. And the cool thing is, 751 horsepower, over 2,000 foot-pounds of torque from the second you turn the motor on. There's no warm-up, there's no spool-up. From the second you turn it on, full torque. And then the third, 260 pounds. 260 pounds. So, there's three parts to how we've been able to achieve this. One, magnetic design. So it's a permanent magnetic motor. And the way we've, and there's quite a few of them out there. Uh, by the way, the only other company in the world that has, been, that has been able to produce a motor of this scale, 350 horsepower, is Siemens out of Germany. Which are a phenomenal company. Uh, people ask us if we're competitors. We will be. 
But at this point, there's no market to compete in, so we're really both trying to convince the aviation industry that we should go all electric. Once we do, we'll definitely be competitors. But for now, there's only two companies in the world who've been able to achieve this. So one is magnetic design. So what type of magnets, how they're aligned, how they're set up, the coils within them, et cetera, et cetera. Second is lightweight structure. So the materials we use are, every single one of them, purposeful. Intentional use of type of material to the type of requirement so that we can really reduce weight. And then the third is a key part, liquid cooling. As I mentioned, when you look at the 80 kilowatt 150 kilowatts, so 150, 200 horsepower electric motors, they don't really need liquid cooling. Low altitude, low speeds, small short distances. Air cooling is okay. I still question it, but it's okay. When you look at 350 horsepower, when you look at 750 horsepower, and you look at commercial applications, which is what we're looking at, so we're not looking at a two passenger airplane. We're looking at minimum nine passenger airplanes. So when you look at that, and the fact that a caravan, and especially one that's flying to Spokane, will probably fly at 15, 20, 25,000 feet, and will fly for an hour, <coughs> air cool does, doesn't cut it. There's not enough air to do it, and if you're flying commercially, you really need consistent performance out of these motors. <coughs> so liquid cooling has to happen. Now liquid cooling can happen in one of two ways. Either have huge radiators, liquids flying around, etc., that would add a lot of weight, or what we've been able to do is integrate the liquid cooling system into the motor itself. <coughs> now everyone's going to ask why, I can't tell you why. I don't have a license to kill you, so the I can tell you what I kill you doesn't apply here, so I just can't tell you. But we found a way to have it liquid cooled, not water, it's a type of oil, that flows through the motor in such a way that without adding weight, allows our motor to act uh, in a cool temperature. So that's the third element of the magic, if you will, that allows us to happen. Siemens, by the way, also have a liquid cooling system. I don't know how they do it, but they have one as well. Again, that's why there's only two companies that are able to do it. This is a very complicated uh, problem to solve. Uh, and it's, I'm happy at least that two companies have been able to do it, because if it was just us, it would be kind of a startup from Australia that maybe isn't real. When you have Siemens participating in it, it gives you really good validation. So, a propulsion system has a lot to do with an aircraft, right, as you all are very well aware. What we're dealing with right now are three key elements. The motor itself, which we've been talking about, the power electronics, so the inverter, and then the control. Those are the three pieces that we're talking about because those are the key elements to make a successful electric propulsion system work. Everything else can be standard. Radiators, you know, batteries we're getting, we can talk about batteries later. Uh, Air data, etc. those are all standard on the aircraft, no need to change anything or do anything revolutionary there. The place where it really, really makes a difference are the batteries, inverters, and control. So we're designing and building those ourselves as well. There is nothing off the shelf that we found from an inverter or control perspective that can deal with the levels of power uh, that we're talking about. So we're designing those as well. Just for interest, the way we split it as a company, our Australian engineering center is doing the motor, our Redmond Engineering Center is doing the inverter and control. So we have kind of inverter, more motor control software here, hardware of motor uh, down in Australia. The rest, while it's not an actual depiction of how we're going to do it, are standard things that anyone in an aircraft would understand. So it's not necessarily that there are two radiators, etc. It's just, that's how it is. So, testing, uh, we have our own test facilities. Uh, at this point, we don't want to rely on external bodies to have to do this, that's one. Two, uh, we have been shocked, but then, once we think about it, not really, that there aren't test facilities to do electric motors of this size. They simply don't exist. Because all the electric motors until now have been 80 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt, a third or a half of the size of what we have. So there are no test facilities that can test this size of electric motor for what we need to. So we set it up ourselves. So in Australia, we have, you can see on the right there, uh, our dynamometer uh, that turns and fit basically, it's a regenerative one as well. So we could, by working the motor, will actually generate power back into the grid. So it reduces our uh, costs and reduces uh, overall consumption of power, which is a great thing. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. So we have a few of those down in Australia. Uh, we have the latest and greatest of uh, uh, management of test cells, etc., with folks running them 24 by 7. And then on the left, which I mentioned two weeks ago, we did our first turn, uh, is our Ironbird. 
So basically, the difference between the two in the test cells is where we test the motor itself in a vacuum, if you will. It's not part of a system. It's really just working to make sure that the motor is performing as it should be. When you put it on the iron bird, that's where you have to make sure that all the systems can behave and play together nice within a confined space of, in this case, the uh, nose of a cystic caravan. So that's different. In a, in a test cell, you can put everything around, make it really comfortable, and there's no issues there. When you're going to an iron bird, you're really trying to see will it actually work the same and perform the same in a confined space, turning an actual aircraft propeller, which has its own uh, elements and behaviors. So that's what we have there. Uh, by the way, interesting story on that. Uh, when I joined the company and we decided that we were going to go after aerospace, one of the questions I asked was, well, do we have uh, a German propeller yet? That's, well, no, not yet. You know, there's still things we have to do. One of the things that we're missing is an actual iron bird. So some sort of frame that we would want it to represent what an aircraft would look like. So we thought, well, what can we do? Well, maybe we can call Cessna, get all sorts of you know, design, engineering documents, et cetera, and have some sort of aerospace welder, maybe put something together. And then the idea came up, uh, let's see if anyone here in Australia operates caravans. And there's my well, you know, point, what's the likelihood that someone operates caravans and has one spare? So well, I don't know, but let's ask. So we found an operator of caravans 30 minutes away from our facility. We called them up, had them come for a visit, got really excited about what we do, and we told them our next step is you know, to get an iceberg if they had any ideas. And they said, well, we happen to have crashed one of our caravans on its tail, which is rare, on its tail, two months ago, front end completely intact, sitting in a hand. Right? So when fate uh, opens its eyes to you, then it's always a good thing. So that's what we have there. And that's us. So not a happy talk. Yeah? Are you willing to share what your battery voltage is going to be? Uh, we're doing a range of batteries uh, between 540, actually we're checking 490 volts, all the way up to 750. So it depends on, because there's a few elements on battery, we're going to talk about that. So we're doing the propulsion system. We're not doing the whole powertrain, which means we're not a battery company. So we're working with a few different battery companies to look at that as an option. Uh, we're following uh, hydrogen fuel cells as a possibility. And then if there are companies who want to do, uh, for example, a hybrid and take our electric propulsion system and power it through some sort of a gas guzzling machine, uh, we're happy to do that as well. We're not developing a hybrid system. Uh, we believe that's an interim solution for what the real long-term solution is. And as you can imagine, if you're delivering a hybrid solution to an airline, you better be ready to support it for the next 15, 20 years the life of the aircraft. You can't just say, oh, I've moved on to new technology, thank you very much. So we're going all electric, but if someone wants to power it with something else, we can do that as well. So because we want to work with a range of batteries, then we said our motor has to be able to do 490 to 70. One other question. Can you, if you know, give us a Tesla's highest performance engine, both free and continuous? For uh, I don't know it by heart, but if I remember the specs, it's about a third to a half of what ours is on, the, on uh, kilowatts to kilogram. And that's their highest performance. Now again, you don't need it to be that critical in a car. The weight isn't that critical. It would be nice to add more, but it's not that critical. So they're about half or a third of the, kilo, the kilowatt to kilogram that we have. Yeah? Uh, two questions. Uh, the uh, three photos that you had, the, the 1250 was the one in the middle, which shows a frontal shot of it. Is that is that the cooling ducting around the uh, the motor, or is I mean, it, it, when you look when you showed the electric, it kind of looked like a stepper kind of kick, so it, it's directly reversible too, is it not? Yes. So every motor is designed to also work with a generator, so you can reverse it and have it be a generator exactly the same without changing anything else. Okay, and then the second one is. When you project it out to six to eight years from now and, and get that range out, is that with these motors? With these motors on a caravan. Very cool. So that's not even talking about the all the design from scratch of the caravan. That's, that's just the design. battery technology yeah. coming up. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So what's the suggested retail on a Magni Five? How much? How much do you have? <laughs> so. Well, I just that, that's a that's a good question. We don't have one yet. 
The reason being, uh, we're not yet sure how we want to price it. So there's a few methodologies if you think of that. Uh, if you look at what cars did, even today to buy an electric car is more expensive than its equivalent gas driven engine. Why? Because you gain the not having to spend fuel, maintenance. I have a Kia Soul EV, uh, which I love. Uh, and one of the biggest things for me that I didn't, uh, that I knew about, but didn't really experience until I experienced it is, you never stop at a gas station. Never. Hybrid, you still stop at a gas station. Electric, never. There's no oil changes. No, I've been driving it for a year and a half, never went to Kia once for service. I actually called them because I was concerned. I said, hey, am I supposed to bring this in? So no, just do a power rotation. And I do that at Costco. There's nothing to do with the motor. So one philosophy is you, the operator, pay for it up front, right? So pay more for my motor. That's one philosophy. Second is, I'll charge you the same as a PT6. You have a 750 horsepower PT6, you pay half a million to a million and a half, depending on the model. I'll charge you exactly the same, and you get the benefit of the lower cost of the lower cost operating cost. That's the second value. Third is I'll even do it cheaper than a PT6 because I can build it cheaper than a PT6 and then give you the value on all sides. Three different philosophies, each one of them is actually correct in its own right. We're not sure where the market is going to be and where we want to be at that point. Yeah. Lubrication and the oil cooling system, are they the same or separate or exactly the same. So the same oil that's lubricating is cooling, etc. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So does your weight, does that include the weight of the cooling system and the weight of the controller, or is that just? That's just the weight of the motor itself. The controller, the inverter that we'll have, is probably going to be around 15 pounds, which is fairly small. And again, we're, we're designing it from scratch because they don't exist today. Yeah. How much of that 15 pounds is copper? In the inverter, not a lot. Really? Not a lot. How are you passing the power right I can't say. <laughs> so, Austin, did I misunderstand you? I thought you earlier said there was no radiator in the cooling system, but the schematic shows a radiator. No, no, there's a radiator as well. If you actually look at the. Torque 
I'd rather go to the lowest model horsepower, beat it in torque, and then be able to address some other models above it as well. Does that make sense? So if you look, for example, the basic caravan uses the, I think it's 690 or 680 horsepower version, as does the Kunar, as does the Kunia, the King Air 90. If you look at the King Air, or the Grand Caravan, they're looking at what they use the engines that are above 750 horsepower. But we can still match torque if we need to. So by creating one motor that can do a range, a much higher range, we can address the same market. Yeah? yeah. Um, what kind of shows do you bring this to as far as the marketing? No shows. So right now we don't attend, uh, we attend, but we don't present our motors at any shows. Uh, we are focused on getting it done uh, versus marketing. It's just a philosophy. Uh, that will probably change uh, next summer, like June, July time frame. Uh, we'll start to take our motors to key shows to show them to the people who need to see them. But other than that, we don't, we don't go to much. We don't even have booths. We, we just attend, but that's it. Yeah. So do you make use of the broader range of the electric capabilities and run a fixed fit prop, or do you have a constant speed prop on there? Uh, you can do both. So you can do variable pitch or fixed pitch. That's really dependent on the operator. Uh, but right now, with everyone we're working with, uh, they still want variable pitch props. One of the reasons is, when you're looking at doing such a step change in technology, one of the big concerns for people is, well, what about the pilots? Will you need brand new training, et cetera? So what we're trying to do is say, what can we minimize and change on any other craft and just change what you need to? So when you're going electric, you can gain more by dealing with the prop. You can design a new prop that's even better for electric, but that's another step change. So our goal is, let's start just with the basics. Let's go to electric propulsion, but leave everything else as much as we can the same, and then start to tackle it once it's in. It's maybe right, maybe wrong, but that's the choice we made at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, two questions. Will this be a battery swap system, you know, on, the, on the, you know, on these flights? And then also with instant torque, this is as big as this is. Um, do we have a, is a wing loading a problem? I mean, if you all of a sudden give it, you know, an acceleration, you can turn the airplane. Off. Yeah. So two really good questions. So I'll start with the last one. That's where the motor controller comes in, right? The software will be able to understand that if the pilot's putting full thrust on the ground, you probably don't want to go to full torque to begin with. So that's where you have the motor controller help the pilots uh, in, what, in what they're doing. So that's one. Uh, two, uh, on that same question, uh, if you go, for example, uh, there are two companies that operate two passenger electric planes, uh, like by aerospace out of Denver, have some, Pipistrel. Uh, they, they train pilots on how to slowly put their throttle forward versus push it forward for exactly that reason. So there are ways to overcome that. On the first question, we've evaluated a lot of battery swap versus charge. The challenge is, again, I'll just use the Cessna Caravan as an example, is not necessarily the aircraft of choice, it's just a really practical workhorse that's good to try, and is what we would consider the smallest commercial aircraft out there, right? It was built for commercial purposes, not as a general aviation aircraft that turned commercial. So when you look at that, we said, what would it take to swap batteries? Because when you look at range, swapping batteries, it's fantastic, right? You land, battery off, battery on, you have new range versus starting to charge. The challenge is a few things. One, we're talking about batteries back to the previous question, 490 to 750 volts. That's a hell of a battery. And if you have someone who isn't a trained electrician that knows what he's doing or what she's doing, dealing with those batteries, that could be a problem, right? In a rainy airport like Seattle, the last thing you need is someone doing something wrong with a 600 volt battery. So battery swaps suddenly become logistically a problem. Then there's all the element of, well, how do you load them, unload them, where do you put them? It just becomes a nightmare. So then when you look at it, you have to move the, the airplane to another part of the airport. No one can be around it, so no passengers, no pilots, nothing can be around it. While some robotic arm, uh, magical robotic arm, or electrician does the work. What we found is in a really efficient manner, you could swap out all the batteries that would be on a caravan. And what we did was basically say, there's a X fuel, X weight of fuel on a caravan. Let's replace that weight with batteries. So if you take all those batteries and do a swap, it'll take about 15 minutes to 20 minutes to replace, to do that replacement. That's pretty quick, right? For you talking about a ton of batteries, like a ton of batteries. 
So that's a good good pun there. Uh, so it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. That's without having to taxi to wherever you are on the side of the airport to do that safely, and without having to taxi back. And then the pilot has to do their walk around. We looked at what would it take to charge. And if you look at a caravan, say, let's say Kenmore Air, their average flight length, 67 miles. 67 miles. Now you think of 100 miles not being exciting. 100 miles is phenomenal for someone like Kenmore Air, or Harbor Air, or Cape Air in the Northeast, all the ones that fly between all the little islands. Right? So 100 miles is something interesting. If you take that battery, you don't need to charge it to, di to uh, discharge it all the way down. Just like a car battery or a phone battery, you don't want to, charge, to discharge it all the way down, and you probably don't want to charge it all the way up either. But you do want to play in that top 30% of the battery. So if you can charge it only for that top part every time you land, after doing about 100 miles, you can do that in 20 minutes. So you're not charging a full battery. You're just charging the first, the top 30%. Just keep you know, topping it off, if you will. Every time you land, top it off 20 minutes. So suddenly that time frame is about the same, but with one difference. Anyone can come and plug in an electric car. You don't have to be an electrician. Again, I'm not a big genius, my 12-year-old isn't, and he can take the plug and plug it into the Kia Soul, and it works, no safety hazards. You can also do your passenger load and upload while that cable is connected, and a pilot can do their walk around while the cable is connected. So from a time efficiency, safety, and practicality, charging is a lot better. Now, when we start to go to ranges that are much longer, that time difference will become bigger and bigger. But at that point, we believe from what we're seeing that battery technology will be at a point that you'll also be able to charge faster, that's one, and two, you'll have to charge less over and over again. So we think that will start to even out. You know, the same could be said if you're going a distance of 1,000 miles on battery, you'll have more batteries to swap as well. So at this point, we've decided that, that charging will be the more practical solution rather than battery swaps. Yeah. So what kind of airflow is required over the engine? What would your cowling look like on the caravan? Uh, exactly the same. Same inlet to... Yep, exactly the same. Are you... Well, you're a lot longer than those, right? No. Nope. No. We took the exact caravan with <laughs> the exact frame, and the only thing we modified was this first third in order to hold our electric motor. But the frame is exactly the same, and you can see we have about two-thirds of space empty. Two thirds of the space empty from taking out a PT6. So exact same house. Same cowling design, same airflow. Yeah. The, the whole idea was again, we tried to minimize any change required. Because when you're going to do an XTC and convince someone to change their caravan, the last thing you need, oh, by the way, you need new cowling. By the way, you need, you need, you need. Yeah. Like, no, open it up, take out that motor, put this one in, I'm simplifying because you have some battery packs as well. But the idea was minimal change to whatever is required. How do you deal with the weight and balance? I guess there's a follow-on since you have all that empty space behind your engine. Right? Yeah, so a lot of empty space. Guess what? FAA requires 30 minutes of spare flight time. What if we were to have a dedicated battery for that 30 minutes that was different? You don't need to worry about life stack. So I saw those pictures back there. I laughed because I'm a skydiver. My emergency pack, my emergency chute, is still a parachute, but built very differently from my main. Right? It's built for a few uses, then replaced. It's packed differently, it's built differently than the one that I open every single weekend. Right? Same thing with batteries. For my day-to-day, -day, I want a battery with really light, uh, long life cycles, multiple cycles. The emergency one, I can have it be a little heavier, less cycles, but I want it dedicated for those 30 minutes of flight. That could be a perfect fit into there and have it separate as an idea. Yeah? It seems to me that we've got an opportunity to put some <clears throat> system synergies there. I mean, here in the Northwest, of course, we have a good portion of the year that there's serious icing considerations, and most folks just stay on the ground. Um, you would get a lot more dispatch reliability if you used some of that juice to keep the airplane warm. Right. Warm, electric de icing, which now on you know, 87 has electric de icing, so that those technologies are starting to come to play. At this point, we've not even thought about that. Again, we're, we're still building the motor, right? Making sure that it works. But well, you're right. I mean, there are so many opportunities for pressurization, you have cabin pressure, uh, de icing. I mean, there's a lot of systems that can work off of this, but we're going to let's tackle one at a time and make sure the plane can take off and, and fly. Yeah? 
any expectations on longevity? Are, are, do you think these motors will go 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 hours? The expectations are very high. <laughs> what, what they'll be, I don't know yet. But from, what, from our, I'll call it theoretical research, they should be able to last around 10,000 hours. 10, but that's theoretical, right? Until you actually operate them for 10,000 hours, who knows? But at least our theory, from what we've seen, from what we've seen on vehicles, from other electric motors, and our designs, we think around 10,000 hours, but again, that, that's theoretical and not worth much. Yeah? And the expected mode of failure, is it variance or is that a normal? It's also unknown. That's one of the things we're testing. So we've already tested, we've already run these tests over 1,000 hours in our test cells. We're now running them, as I mentioned, on the iron grid as well. Uh, there's a, 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 a ton of things that can happen, which is why we're working, for example, with the FAA, with CASA, IASA, to work on them. Uh, but you can have bearings, right? You can have uh, short circuits. It's an electric system. So short circuits. I mean, there's a million things that could happen, uh, which is why we test for every one of them. Yeah. Can you uh, tell us what your noise level delta is between the ET6 and the ET6? Mm, that's a good question. So the first video we did of our first term, uh, we sent it to two reporters, and they said, hey, can you send us the video with the sound? And we know that is the video with the sound. <laughs> it, it's like a car. So think of an electric car. The only thing you hear are the wheels on the road. You don't hear the engine itself, the motor. There's no noise. It's exactly the same. So when we turn on the end, the motor, I was there for the first one, it was fascinating. You turn on the motor, and there's no sound. So I have to ask the guy, hey, are we starting yet? So yeah, it's on. There's just no sound. Once you turn the prop, you have the wind blowing, the sound of the wind. Significantly quieter. It's not silent because the propeller is making noise, but it's significantly quieter both before you, you, you engage the propeller and even after than you will with the traditional aircraft. We're going to take measurements. We're going to, once we put them on the actual aircraft, we're going to bring to side-by-side -side comparisons, etc. But even just on the face of it, you're significantly quieter. And by the way, another cool part, there's no smokes or emissions or anything coming out of it. Anything. It's inside our building. There's nothing come out, coming out of it, which is phenomenal. Yeah? You might have covered it, but is the uh, inverters you're developing, are they liquid-cooled also? Yes, also liquid-cooled, and yeah, our development is liquid-cooled with the same liquid, same system. Yeah? It's hardly one step. I assume you're not doing your own gigafactory, but I also assume you're making your own battery packs. Are they going to be liquid-cooled as well? Uh, so we're not making our own battery packs at this point. Again, we're working with other battery companies to try and be, I, I would rather be battery or power agnostic. So I'd rather work with multiple battery companies than try to tie myself into one. That may change as we progress in time, but right now we're working with a few different ones. We have specs that we require, but they're developing. Are they going to the full too? Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Do you expect your cooling drag is going to be a little bit less? My cooling drag? Cooling drag. I can't answer that question. It's not I can't tell you, but I just can't answer that question. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, is the technology that you work in here scalable down? It is scalable down. That's, so we've been asked that uh, by Uber and multiple other question companies. Could we go down to some point? Go here on the next plane as far as I know. Yeah. So is it scalable down? Yes. Would you gain anything? No. Because our technology as part is integrated into being a liquid cooling system, if you scale down, you'll have a weight penalty of course. Than, than otherwise. So that's one of the reasons, by the way, we selected to choose 350 and above and not go down. Because at that point, we have no huge advantage. Because you're also going to not fly your little plane at 15, 20,000 feet. So from that perspective, for the most part. Yeah, it's a whole different market. Yeah. Right? Changes under so right now, no. we're not. It, it is scaled down from a tech perspective, but we're not going down there. By the way, uh, a point that... Uh, not to answer your question, but another one, one of the advantages of electric motors, you go up to altitude, doesn't impact performance. Same torque. Yeah. So this is a speculative question that I realize is something that doesn't have anything to do with, but looking at the future of electric aviation, I'm building a biplane mm -hmm. designed in the 60s, and it's designed for a 125 to 180 horsepower gas motor. And I'm thinking to myself, this plane is going to be done in about 10 years. Right? In about 10 years, I'm going to be looking at this choice between a gas motor and an electric motor, and I'm kind of wondering 
what, what, if you were to cast your mind forward 10 years, could you see reasonably fitting 150 horsepower electric motor to a plane like that that was designed for gasoline and expecting to have a two to three hour flight time? Does that seem like you would really intend Absolutely. Absolutely. But I will say that when you compare that, it'll be like today, one of my dream cars is one of those old Ford pickups, 46, 48, time era. My wife tells me there's no way you're going to buy one until you're actually 65. <laughs> so I still try to convince her that there's a beautiful, right, it's a beautiful piece of machinery. And you have people who deal in these old, old technology mo uh, uh, motors. Ten years from now, that's what you'll be facing. Ten years. That the 150 horsepower gas motor you'll need will be historic. Because everything will be electric at that size. Bigger size, not yet. But in 10 years, everything that's 150 horsepower, 200 horsepower, I think will be electric and gas will be the rarity. And two to three hours is going to be easy. I mean, 10 years from now, it's going to be easy. There's technology today, and I'm not talking lithium ion. I mean, that in itself is developing, but not fast enough. There's sulfur based, aluminium based, solid state batteries. I mean, the uh, hydrogen fuel cells, the technology on that's working and progressing uh, pretty rapidly as well. You'll have multiple options at that point to go on electric. Cool. Yeah. So I know nothing about electric motors. How does your motor differ from, say, uh, a piece electric train motor? Mm. So, yeah. Uh, theoretically, not a lot. If you take an electric motor on a train or an electric motor on, you know, there's a little boat you can rent in Seattle, the little electric boats. Theoretically, there's not a lot, right? You have power going in, you have coils and magnets, uh, and they create a spin, and that turns the shaft. Uh, but big, that's kind of the, the biggest theory. But it's like asking what's the difference between a Formula One engine and a uh, Ford Focus engine. They're both gas engines, right? But it's the way they're designed, the way they're built, the pieces that are used in there, the types of magnets, how the magnets are aligned, how many magnets you use. How many coils do you use? What type of coils? What are they made of? How are they uh, built? Et cetera, et cetera. This is the difference. So that's the answer I can't give you, which is what's our design that allows it to happen. So mostly it's like rare earth magnets versus... Not, not, not necessarily. By the way, uh, that's a thing I was taught by our own engineers. Rare earth magnets aren't that rare. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, they're called that. But they're not that rare anymore. But it's the type of magnet, the shape of it, the size of it, the direction that, so you can decide on the polarity and the direction of the magnet. So it's what direction they're used and set up, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that make our engine the way it is. Yeah? How do you, how, how do you think you um, would build time with this out? Because um, it's 10,000 hours takes a long time. Yeah, but well, I mean, there's no engine company in the world that actually ran 10,000 hours before going there. There's, that's the beauty of our regulatory uh, bodies, is they have standard tests they want you to pass. So for example, one of them is an endurance test. So take a, the regulatory the FAA requires that for an endurance test, you're running for six hours straight doing flight profiles. And they give you specifics, here's what we need you to do. We've already done it. Other companies that do electric say, ah, you know, electric motors won't fly a plane for six hours. So that test isn't relevant. So well, who am I to say it's not relevant? Our regulatory body decides it's relevant, and until they change it, I'm going to adhere to it. I would actually rather the regulation be more stringent, because that's also a filter, right? Companies that aren't serious, that don't have the funding, don't have the know-how, don't have the knowledge, I would rather they not be part of it and allow those who are to be part of it. So if the regula regulatory body is more stringent, I'm okay with that. I don't view it as a hurdle, I just view it as a gate that you have to go through for all the justified reasons. So how do you build time? Test cells, iron birds, start flying, and then you extrapolate based on the data you collect, and we collect a whole lot of data. So you extrapolate based on that data and start to look out and see what it looks like. Yeah? So you said you don't have emissions, but that also means you don't bleed air, you don't have, uh, you know, the, the free, uh, uh, that is pressure free. Right. So how, uh, you want this to be as low uh, barrier to entry in terms of conversion. So how are you going to deal with some of those? Because I know on like, Bigger planes have got very really late through there, you have electrics and stuff, but that's on a huge scale. Right. What about on the smaller scale? Because, like, you know, your compression uh, system, air conditioning, other things like that. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll say that we're still evaluating that. 
there's two potential answers, but we're still in the evaluation of that. One is you do do a pump electric, but it's a scaled down version. And it's a lot easier to do, for example, electric de icing for a caravan size than it is for an 87 size, right? Mm -hmm. Those are things that scale down actually fairly easily. So that's one element, is to do it for all electric, including uh, pressurization of cap and so on. Second part of the answer is while this may not provide a uh, compressor or bleed air to it, you could put smaller versions of this as additional power sources to work off of bleed air. So there are ways to, to overcome that as well. But we don't know which is the right way, and that's the way we're evaluating that now. Yeah? Solar augmentation? Sorry? Solar augmentation for your uh, Yeah, so solar is an interesting one. Uh, again, you, you go back to Fire, the George Fire is a good friend. Uh, he's a genius when it comes to aero engineering. Uh, he tried a few solar aircraft. The challenge is, in order to get enough power out of solar on an aircraft, you need to have panels from here to I won't say Trinity, but pretty much when it comes to wings. Uh, so, you, so what he was doing, for example, was doing a high-altitude aircraft of 60,000 feet type with very, very long wings that were entirely covered with solar panels to get enough power to loiter. But you wouldn't have a lot of takeoffs. So that's not really powerful enough. Now, the flip side of that is, or the other side of that coin, to have solar power augmented charging stations, that could be interesting. So if you're looking at rural airports or airports that are not necessarily big hubs, there's a lot of there's a lot more space around them. So look around here versus CPAC, right? You could put a few solar stations here, start to charge batteries, and then use those as needed. So there's other ways to use solar, wind, hydro around rural or, or secondary airports that isn't necessarily on the airport. Yeah. We had a speaker here sometime in the last year who was also talking about question of solar power between the team up. And I think that the speed he said was something like 60 miles an hour was the break-even point for a pure solar powered, or maybe it's 25 miles an hour, it really low. I hit 22, I think. Yeah. 22? Yes. Really, really low. Low. So low. This was uh, Zunum, I had to right? I'm a, yes, I'm yeah, thinking, yeah. probably. But, but it was interesting to me that, that there is that break-even point. That mm -hmm. if you want to have a plane that is entirely solar powered, that's actually where you do it, is at this ridiculously low speed. Which could be interesting for an individual, but for commercial, 22 miles an hour, if you're going to fly, you might as well take a bicycle, an electric bicycle, and... <laughs> 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 if you're going to fly an internet connection, like, you know, Google was talking about the internet. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, really interesting, but so, so, so interestingly enough, one of our top engineers came from Google X, it's the Makani uh, program, where they had these giant uh, aircraft type flying. Yeah, absolutely. For that type of purpose, yes. For maybe a drone, a delivery drone, maybe that's attractive as well, because speed maybe, if it's not the two hour delivery, if it's the multi hour delivery, maybe it's interesting. Right. But for a passenger or commercial type aircraft, yeah. not quite. Yeah? I just want to go back to your topping off the battery. Yeah. I don't know if most people realize that charging from 80 to 100% takes just as long as it goes from 0 to 80. Yeah, that's right. So topping it off is not really realistic. Actually, using the 30 to 70 percent range is more efficient for charging time. Yeah. What's your range? Uh, what's your range if you use 30 to 70 percent versus the top 20? If you versus going from 100 to 30 percent versus going from 100. Right now, you're saying your range is 100 miles an hour. 100 miles. Sorry, 100 miles, miles, right? Right. Ready, math? Okay. Using only 30 percent of the battery. Question. You're going to use 30 percent of the right. battery for that. 30 percent of the battery. Okay. Yeah. Where did the regenerative cables uh, in the system come into play? Say on a flight from Seattle to Spokane, did it come down from 30,000 feet to 10,000 feet and use that to recharge? Theoretically, you could. We're looking at that. The, the notion of regenerative is very sexy, right? When you talk about electric, on my Kia Soul, you put the lid off your gas and it slows down to regenerate. So it's very sexy, but. It's so little power when you're talking about a commercial flight. If you're looking, for example, again, back to the space surface roll, when you're looking at a training aircraft that goes up and down multiple times, every time it goes down, it can give a little more juice. When you look at a commercial operation, say out to Spokane, it'll go down once. And unless you're, again, going back to skydiving, unless you're nose diving down and you're getting that propeller to spin and give you power, you'll get some back, but it won't be significant. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So again, we're looking at that as an option as well. 
because it is attractive to get something back, but it isn't like you'll get 10, 20% back on a flight. It'll be very small. Yeah? Well, the, the aspect of, of the fact that you're getting it in the long part of the cycle, right? You're, you you, you want to be like, you know, uh, dropping off a blimp and then charging on the way down. Or right. Whatever. It's being at the end of the cycle, you're going to be plugging in a few minutes anyway. Right. That extra time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's very useful. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Since we are about home-built airplanes, we give you your very own home-built airplanes.